but I'm going to go to this next thing because I was thinking about your book, The Wealth Elevator. Why did you write that book and why did you call it The Wealth Elevator? It's a number one Amazon bestseller. It's been out there for a little bit. Tell us about that. There's never been a book out there written for like folks like us, mainly accredited investors. There's a lot of books out there in the personal finance space, you know, the Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman types, mm -hmm. where, you know, in the book, I have like this breakdown of a building, right? Or the elevator is the idea. It's a construct, but it's a framework of there's different levels to the wealth building journey. The basement level where you make less than $50,000 and in credit card debt. I personally was lucky enough, obviously, we went through my story. I didn't start there, right? Yeah. And I don't know anything about getting out of the basement level, but I identify it. I think that's where most of the personal finance advice is predicated towards, I right? Mm -hmm. I agree. So like a lot of people are beyond that level. And the first floor of the wealth elevator were, was where I was at in my 20s, right? Buying little rental properties. I think in this world, a lot of people in who read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, I think it's a great book in terms of mindset, but it gives you very little actionable advice, Correct. right? The author says very little in many, many words. That said, I think it's amazing in terms of it, it's written in such a way to get people's mindsets out of that order. Yes. But I myself was, I didn't have any bad habits in a way. I was already thinking about, it. heck, I already had five rentals by the time I read that book. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been doing all this stuff from the start. Okay. So I pick things up. I try and take people from like the second floor of the wealth elevator when you're already an accredited investor. You hear rentals is the way to go, but obviously it's not scalable, as I mentioned here. But then a lot of what I, I try to be the trailblazer, right? Like I meet folks like yourself, family offices, right? Like we buy properties from them. And I've kind of like, I always try and just be the fly on the wall. I've always been the youngest guy in the room. And then I just shut up and I just listen and I observe. Mm -hmm. And what I've realized that there's these, what I call like end game, right? This is what I call like the third level in the wealth elevator for people it ranges, but generally it's four to $5 million net worth. You get to a certain point where you're financially free. I bet you're, you're probably in this world, right? And you don't really need more, right? You, you don't certainly don't need to take on any more risk, but the problem is not a lot of people get there. Most people who, like if I just stayed on my linear path, studied hard, went to school, became an engineer, maxed out my 401k, I would barely be on the second floor by the time I'm 50. And, but if you do alternate investments, you enact these different tax strategies, real estate professional status maybe, and then a little bit of infinite banking, this trifecta of strategies, get you to this third floor of the wealth elevator pretty quickly, like maybe a third of the amount of time that you get there in your forties and fifties. And yeah, you want to, you're obviously going to increase your net worth from there, especially as you start to interact with other high net worth accredited investors and get better deal flow. But like I go through and we have this flow chart and this like chart of like how the strategies kind of change throughout these levels. So I talked through a lot of these like nuances and give a little insight of, hey, what do family offices do on this level? Not that you're going to ever get there in this generation. Normally it takes two to three generations to get there, but how you can like cut learning cycles, right? Well, uh, call it time. What I hear from what you're saying is big thing is that number one, you got to get in the pool. You can't stand around the outside looking and trying to figure out how you're going to understand it all and do it. it you, you go very slowly doing that. And then I was also thinking about how we talked about pretty quickly, because when I began this, I pretty quickly was like five years. It takes longer than five years unless you're going to get really lucky. But to, to it's a steady, steady investing. You lose some, you win some, you win more than you lose, but the losses hurt a lot. But it's just the way the thing goes. You ultimately come out ahead. You ultimately do. And you've had this cash flow all along and you've learned so many things from all these people that are also in the pool with you that you just are that much ready for that legacy that can get you to that family office stage. Maybe not in your generation, but your fit, your kid's generation or the generation after that, where they are now managing money and that is their job and they are improving everything around them, everything that's important to them. Now they have the money to help make it better while their money is still working for them to bring more so that your family can keep going and going and going from the thing you started. 
I hope that makes sense to you because that's the legacy part of this whole thing. It is not just about you, at least for me. It's not just about me and what I can do for myself, but I do like to live and I like a lot of good things, but it's for what my kids learn and what their kids learn and what they have and can do with what they have, learn to do. It's not just about keeping it and all the things that we learn about what we think and hear about wealthy people. It's about changing the world to make it a better place. And I, I get on that soapbox every single time, Lane, and I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm more of a numbers guy. And I, the way I look at it is if you give your kids more than a million dollars half, you're probably going to hit that concept of overkill is going to spoil them. Mm -hmm. Again, that again supports the whole four to five million dollar net worth threshold, right? If you get to that level, obviously you're going to keep growing it, right? Probably to over eight figures by the time you you pass away. But you get to that thir certain threshold, it's like any more is just overkill. And it's more the lessons of the money mindsets. And what I would argue is, and why I'm big on community and we have kind of events here in Hawaii, is getting your kids around other kind of people in this world, right? People with yeah. these, not just rich people, but value-oriented rich people, because we're very exactly. different than the people who go to the country club, right? A lot of those people are trust fund kids. We're first generation multimillionaires. Like we're yes. not into that. Yes. In we're, that look at the stuff we're investing in. It's like yeah. super blue collar. Like you, you guys are doing like change, change out people's diapers and like the assisted living and like class B apartments. This is not sexy stuff, exactly. right? But these are like, necessities that are very needed in this world and like these blue collar services. Yep. Our most recent investment is in a, it's actually a single family home that's rented to a sober living community. So we're doing now, instead of assisted living, now we're doing sober living and we're going to end up buying a bunch of stuff doing that, which is it, it's a great cash flow, but that's another, we're not talking about deals right now. Um, so you have, you're talking about your community in Hawaii. Do you do things other places or should I just bring, get a bus, a plane and come out to Hawaii and do some stuff with you guys out there? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like I mentioned before, most people in this world don't have time for happy hours here. We're not into that. We don't, we got time. So that's why we try and concentrate everything into one event. And then we we'll do virtual things too. But, you know, like I'm big on like immersion and but you got, we got to do things with people are busy and what better bait than bringing people to Hawaii and tricking your spouse there for, it was this thing you're going to, well, just hang out in the pool, bring the kids, but it's magical, right? When you get, again, we're all weirdos doing things very differently than most people out there. And it's very cool to get people in this world in, into one place for more than a couple of days, right? The, the thing that kind of brings me joy of doing this thing the most is like creating communities and like new relationships. Like when you get past the age of 30, you don't really meet new people in your life unless you're forced to because your kids play with their kids. But you know, maybe I should say, maybe I can say it because nobody's going to listen to this podcast if it's any of them, but I am tired of listening to people investing in their Tesla stock and like their 401k. Like I just can't relate, especially being a business yeah. owner too. Yes. Yeah. But you come to this world and you break bread with people, you spend some late couple late evenings with people, you get to know people very, very well. And it's that high intensity really forges a start of a good relationship moving forward. And, and it, it is very important, right? Because as a past investor, you don't know what to believe out there. There's all these websites that supposedly give you reviews, but it's all like BS sponsored. Yeah. You know? yeah. And unless you have, I was actually on another podcast and I was talking about see these so-called like, like bookworms who listen to a lot of podcasts, they go around and they get a lot of these lists of operators to invest in. And I'm like, all right, well, yeah, good job. You can use ChatGPT and scrape websites and go and egg or the SEC website yeah. and scrape operators. But it's like, how many purely passive accredited investors do you know? To me, again, I'm a numbers guy. You need to have three times as many purely passive accredited investor buddies to be in your ecosystem as to one operator, right? If you're somebody out there who has lists of 50, 100 operators, but does only has like a handful of buddies, your ratios are all off, bro. Are you talking about if you're going to be an operator or are you talking about as a, as a passive investor? As what, a, what, as what a are, passive investor, yeah. Okay, so say that again then, because I was thinking about it from a different point of view. 
Yeah. You- so I've seen a lot of people, like a lot of my investors are engineers, right? So they're like mm-hmm. list builders and spreadsheet yeah. junkies. So they'll go on like iTunes, Google Play and YouTube, and they'll find people who prance around and have podcasts and trying to raise capital and from XYZ moniker capital group. Okay. We're just new, new general partners, operators, and they'll create these lists of like operators or they'll find forms out there. And the problem is you don't know who to believe because everything out there is unverified. This yeah. is the private placement world. You don't know who yeah. to track records. It's all made up at the end of the day, if you ask me. And now we as operators have access to CoStar. And when we do due diligence on deals, we can pull from Yardi. We can see how their assets are actually operating and what they actually own. But as a passive investor, you're walking in the dark on this and you don't know. How do you mitigate that? Well, you need to have a network of purely passive accredited investors, ideally of which who are actually investing in it to help you. To um, know how yeah, their deals are going and who they are. Yeah, clear away the shroud, right? Yeah. Because yeah. unfortunately, this business is filled with shysters here yeah. and there. You and, I, and charlatans, yep. You and I have interacted with them and distanced ourselves and gotten away from them throughout the years, and which makes we have a little bit more mature ecosystems ourselves. Yes. Um, but that's, that's not practical advice for a passive investor listening. So let's like what, I, what you, I would what say. You talk, what you talked about while running through the minefield with your, your underwear on, that is, that is the pain of where, how you got to where you are. So it is perfectly, it is up to you as an investor or as a thinking about being an investor, passive investor in deals. If you want to run through the minefield without your clothes on and see if you make it to the other side, that is entirely up to you. People who've done that already have learned the steps to take so that you don't necessarily have to lose a limb to get to where you're trying to go. So that, I think that's a very, very key thing because a lot of doctors, lawyers, engineers, these folks that are used to doing things on our own and reading a book and understanding what to do, we want to run through the minefield and figure it out. This is not the place to do that. I'm gonna, I, it, I, I don't recommend it. I recommend finding people who are doing the thing you want to do and talking to them a lot. Yeah. Well, to run through the minefield, each step costs 50 grand. I mean, it is. My, first, my first 15 deals I invested as a general partner slash LP, one out of five of them was like a blown up, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. out of $250,000, 50 of them, 50 grand of that was up in smoke for the most part. And one could say that's not too bad, especially when you get risk adjusted returns on the other side in a good bull market. But that may not be acceptable to you, but you know, you can never eliminate risk. This is not a risk-free world. And this, that's why this world is not for everybody. Yeah. But how you yeah. mitigate that risk, the way I did it initially, because as you guys now see me as a very untrusting person, I would, I would learn how to underwrite the deals, take the P&Ls and use my own reversion cap rates to kind of underwrite the deal before I even wasted my time talking to the operator and sponsor, right? Mm-hmm. I already know how they're underwriting. Are they very conservative or do they have lofty expectations? At the end of the day, it all comes down to the model. And there's three or four key cells in the spreadsheet that, that define that model. I try to educate people on exactly what is in that model to go and check. But then that's like my criteria or my search criteria. I start there first because it's number based. I can do that in my underwear at home. Yeah. And then I waste my time talking to people, right? Because I'm an introvert. I don't really like to do that type of stuff. But you know, that's what you got to do, right? And then you invest in some deals, you meet some other passive investors, and it all comes together after a few years. So you guys heard Lane say, waste my time talking to other people. He didn't mean it like it's not worth it. It's his introvert self who'd rather be at home reading the book and understanding it that way, who also realizes he has to be out there talking to other people to really get the full picture. So please don't, isolate those words and think you don't need to spend time talking to other people because Lane continued and talked about how that is a necessary part of your education and not getting blown up. If you get in there and you lose 50,000 your first deal, you may not go forward because that's a painful loss. If you're in a group where other people are there and it's like, yeah, yeah, we've done that here. Here's how you not do that again. Here's how you do it. It makes it a completely different experience. Still painful, but a different yeah, experience. Yeah, so, still painful. Okay. But yeah, like, but you're pointing this out as if you guys are reading between the lines, you got to, this is a world of living in the gray, right? There is never going to be, you're looking at deals that are so different. You're not comparing apples to apples. 
if you're uncomfortable with it, I mean, I get you're new with it, but if you're uncomfortable with it, again, this world is not for you. This is not, that's what the traditional investments are for, where you get killed with fees and that type of stuff in that world. Financial freedom is not for everybody, but this is just my experience going through the, the most difficult part, I think, is this initial stage yeah. of moving through this world until you can develop what you're looking for is like four to five good sisters and bros, right? You get along, your families are connected and you guys have five times the amount of like visuals out there. Yeah. And then you start to develop a short list of operators to work with. Again, assets under management is a good starting point, I think. But at the same time, you have institutional operators, you have the brand new people that we said, maybe be careful of. I think you're trying to find somebody in the middle, right? Somebody who is trying to emerge, has been an emerging and emerging operator, right? What be, part of that is when you work with institutional operators, you're going to get worse splits and fee structures. You're yeah. not going to, you might be lucky to double your money in 10 years. It could yeah. be reliable. But it, the economics just aren't going to be there. You might as well just be investing in S&P 500 oh. for that. Mm -hmm. And then plus the minimums working with these guys are going to be like half a million, $2 million minimums, probably yeah. too rich for most people's blood there, especially when you want to diversify into multiple, multiple projects over multiple years. Yeah. But, you know, they, they, that's it. Again, there's a spectrum to operators here. Yeah. There's all kinds of tricks of the trade, but I think it just, it, it can be learned in a course. I think, which I think goes in the face of doctors and engineers, right? Where we come up through this academic yeah. world. Yeah, that definitely comes with experience, which we all also know, lawyers, doctors, engineers, we go to school, we get our education, and then you get into the real world. It's like, okay, that was the foundation. Now the experience has made me the real doctor, surgeon, lawyer, whatever you are, that makes you good at what you do, not just having the title. Lane, this has been really, really good. How can people get in touch with you if they want to spend some time with you in Hawaii or on one of your virtual events? They can check out the book, The Wealth Elevator on Amazon. Okay. And if they, they reach out, we can, we got some author copies on Audible and stuff like that. We can hook them up with a copy. Okay. But yeah, if not, um, team at thewealthelevator.com. But yeah, that's, we worked as more of, again, I'm an introvert, so I don't like big groups of people and I want to know everybody. Stranger danger as we teach our daughter, right? But I love it. But yeah, that's why we like, we want to know everybody out there. We also talk about deals and we don't want like our price per unit type of stuff floating out there in the ethos, right? Com directly competing with us too. But yeah, I think maybe we talked a little bit, some of negative things out there, but I think it's important to know when you get into this world and go in eyes wide open. It's hundred percent eyes wide open. There's the, there, the pretty side is when things go perfectly well, doesn't happen very often. You will over time. And as you get better, and if you, listen and have a mentor you will ma not make as many mistakes and lose as many arms and blood lose as much blood from the mistakes because you're going to make mistakes if you're out there doing it by yourself you 100 percent are going to make mistakes i started by myself you guys know the story of us losing all of our stuff in 2008 w lane smarter guy than me started in his 20s but every deal has not gone well and you learn from every single one of those how you make it better the next time so that thing that one thing whatever that was or few things don't happen again so mouse is going to show up and teach you another lesson 100 percent is going to happen when you're with people learning the lessons together it's a much less painful lesson in general and now you're even you can all now benefit from that whole thing and all carry that knowledge forward so that we make this place better and make investing easier and better for so many more people, the middle class, the how how the folks working hard can get better returns on the money and not just have to work themselves, but let their money get out there working for them.